Today we're going to be talking about the history of educational technology. We're going to specifically look at the 1800s through about 2010, even though educational technology technically dates back until um, caveman times. Around 1880 to the late 1800s, the typical school classroom was a one-room classroom with students who held a handheld slate with a piece of chalk where they would write their notes. And the students were expected to memorize everything they wrote down on this slate in order to uh, master their lessons. Eventually, a full-size chalkboard was put into a classroom that still maintained its presence in classrooms even till modern times and today where the teacher could write a great deal of information and could separate the sections of the chalkboard for various grade levels in their classroom. It was cheap and it was efficient to, a way of putting information in front of the class and students could copy it onto their slate. And the slate really was um, pretty much the standard technology tool until the early 1900s when mass production of notebooks and pencils uh, made them obsolete, but the chalkboard still remained as the main teaching tool in the front of the classroom. So in the early 1900s, mass production of pencils and notebook paper replaced the uh, handheld slate, and the advantage to that was the paper could be saved and used later as a reference, as opposed to being required to commit them to memory. About 1905, we had the development of the stereoscope, which allowed 3D imagery to show to students and it presented realistic images of events and people of the past as well as the surrounding world. And this made it very, um, this production of images became really important in the classroom when moving pictures allowed for silent instructional videos to be shown to the students. Moving through the 20, the invention of the radio became a very popular medium to broadcast lessons and information to students. Universities would have their own broadcasting station to uh, broadcast information to students in the campus, which could also be picked up by anybody in the surrounding area who had a radio tuner. Eventually we began and we were able to get the film strip projector which was used quite proficiently in the classroom by teachers uh, through the late uh, 1990s and early 2000s before DVDs, uh, VHS tape DVDs uh, and the such pretty much made them completely obsolete. But for you know several decades the film projector was a staple in the classroom using celluloid film to project images that was much better than the stereoscope that was previously used. During the uh, war, the military uh, invested a lot of uh, research and money into generating the overhead projector. Uh, the military used it to assist in the training of soldiers who were bound for battle in Europe during World War II, and ultimately this tool makes its way into the uh, K-12 classroom all across the country. And it's still used today, but largely has been replaced by digital projectors and uh, digital document cameras. During the 40s, a major invention in classroom technology was the mimeograph. The mimeograph machine made it quick and easy to hand crank copies of assignments to an entire class in just a few minutes. I think everybody kind of remembers the blue ink smell that you would get from a freshly run set of mimeographs papers uh, handed out in the grade school. Uh, and it is a staple in every school until again a new technology called the photo photocopier came and replaced it. Then in the, f in the 50s learning labs uh, which were spurned by their use in World War II to train troops in foreign language became popular mostly in foreign language instruction rooms and they're still being used today as learning language labs all across the country where students would sit and listen to recordings of a particular language and they would then master it through repetition and other exercises in the learning lab. 
Then in 1957, B.F. Skinner created his learning machine, and this was very innovative, in which it allowed the teachers to prepare lessons for students who could then learn at their own individual pace, instead of everybody marching to the same uh, pace of the teacher, where the fast student would be done very quickly and then sit bored while the rest of the class catches up, or the slower student who would struggle to keep up and sometimes become frustrated. This machine allowed the students to do their schoolwork and their studies at their own pace. Television, which was made popular in the 50s, really made an impact in the 60s when educational television really began to take hold. The production of Sesame Street ushered in the age of children's television. Many children grew up in this era watching familiar friends such, such as Big Bird, Cookie Monster, and the count on television and learn to count and learn their ABCs through watching these programs. A develop in the mid to late 70s was the handheld calculator. The handheld calculator allowed students to basically get rid of their slide rule and replace it with a revolutionary tool brought on by the invention of the microprocessor. It allowed complex calculations to be completed in lightning speed. However, it was still slow to be adopted by teachers because of the fear of losing important math skills by relying on a computer. However, it did, prevent, it did permit greater movement of students toward math and science because it allowed students to um, focus on the problem-solving aspects and not be bogged down by the lengthy, sometimes lengthy computations to um, solve higher-order math problems. And then in the mid to late 70s, a small computer company was founded called Apple Computer, which eventually becomes the dominant computer platform in the education world, but then loses significant ground to Windows-based PCs later. And then we'll see uh, in about 20 years that it does make a resurgence and has a major impact in education uh, even today. About 1980, the very first personal computers begin to appear in schools and the advantage of these machines allows the student to view information on CD-ROM which can one CD-ROM could contain all the video imagery text audio of an entire encyclopedia set right in the palm of the hand of a student viewable on the computer monitor in the late 80s the graphing calculator improved upon the microprocessor chip calculator and it, it had the ability to have graphs drawn on the little LCD panel uh, further allowing math students, science and engineering students to focus on solving problems instead of uh, doing computations. And then about 1987 the PowerPoint program was introduced. Initially it was called Presenter and was released ironically by uh, the Apple Macintosh company. However, in July of that year, Microsoft purchased it from Apple as its first significant software acquisition, and it purchased the rights for PowerPoint for about $14 million, and they did pretty good on that one. About 1988, the first digital LCD projector company was formed, and data projectors will eventually replace the overhead projectors in many classrooms and universities across the country uh, until they're still being used today. And of course, the digital data projector is what is used to show all of those PowerPoints in the classroom. So ushering into the 1990s and we begin to have the information age. So in the early 1990s the very first interactive whiteboard was showcased and allowed students to touch and manipulate images on the screen. Then in 1994 the World Wide Web or the Internet was invented by Tim Berners-Lee while he was working with CERN and that opened the digital revolution so that you could display information from computer servers around the world in a graphical manner instead of just text as it had been previously through the university systems. The speed and the power of personal computers would increase exponentially over the years and that would uh, follow Moore's law of increasing processor power uh, giving greater ability to provide that rich media content so that things like simulations and communications through the internet and collaboration could occur. In the late 1990s, the very first wiki site um, goes live. 
uh, which allowed people, everyday people, to create web content and information using the wiki markup language text format. In 1997, a small company named Google incorporated and it became poised to make searching the web more efficient and more relevant and this makes researching the web easier than ever before. And by 1999, the first blog site LiveJournal goes live, ushering in the era of the read-write web, where the web becomes user-contributed more than just user-consumed. So in the 21st century, we see a lot more innovation. Uh, laptop computers become the de facto tool for teachers and students to access the internet to do their research and for learning in a more mobile setting. Rich web media on the internet allows st streaming of audio and video into the classroom, making learning more on demand than with other formats in the previous decades. Wikis again become very popular and they emerge as an easy way for teachers and students to create their own web content. First introduced in the 1990s, it wasn't until the internet access in the classroom allowed schools to adopt this and enable communication with stakeholders such as parents uh, and community members and business members. Wikis are used as tools for students to create digital essays with images, videos, and other widgets as part of the overall presentation. Then around, 19, around 2005, uh, the first clicker was introduced. Uh, clickers allow teachers to get quick feedback from students about the understanding of the lesson material. Companies such as, such as SharePoint, eInstruction, and others appear in classrooms, and other companies create virtual clickers through mobile devices and cell phones uh, in the late uh, 20, uh, 2010 era. 2008. Evernote launches as a way to remember everything on the web. It's just one of many what are called Web 2.0 apps that allow educators and students to browse the information on the internet and clip and save information as they do their research and they learn about a specific content area. They can save text, they can save whole web pages, they can save pictures, videos, and so on. Then in 2008, LiveScribe, which is a smart pen, begins to be sold to college students as a way to take lecture notes and record the lecture audio synchronously. The student can then tap the special paper on the notebook and listen to that part of the lecture and help him or her understand the notes. K-12 schools followed suit with that, adapting the pen for many other uses other than just recording lectures. And finally, in the year 2010 and beyond, Apple released the first iPad tablet, and it's quickly been adopted by schools as the cheaper, more portable platform for education. The abundance of iPads and other similar devices of free, with free or low-cost educational apps from the iTunes Store or from the Google Play Store means greater student engagement and interaction. The penetration of smartphones into the average consumer increases the connectivity of students to the internet and to others while in the classroom. The direction of education is taking off exponentially as newer and more affordable mobile devices come to market. This allows students to become uh, much more connective and can learn from each other just as much, if not more, than from the teacher.